the Instructor Podcast with Terry Cook, talking with leaders, innovators, experts and game changers about what drives them. Welcome to the Instructor Podcast. As always, I am your splendid host, Terry Cook, and I'm delighted to be here and even more delighted that you have chosen to listen. This is a show where I speak to leaders, innovators, experts and game changers to look at ways that you can improve your driving school and maybe become an even more awesome driving instructor. And that's no different today. Got an excellent episode for you today featuring Emma Hallett as we discuss how to work with students with additional needs. Cover a whole, a whole range of topics including Emma's history, the adaptation she's made to her car, what ADIs can do if they get someone that they uh, maybe think has additional needs but hasn't told them what we can do to help people, whole host of stuff, and it's a brilliant episode. But just before we dive in, I want to give a bit of a call to arms, a bit of a call to action that you can now vote for the Instructor Podcast in the awards that have popped up. So you may see them in Intelligent Instructor and also Go Roadie. You can go vote for us over there. And if you are liking these shows, it would be wonderful if you could take a moment to go and vote for us on the awards. If you don't like the show, or maybe you like the show, but you don't like me, you don't want me to win, then still take a moment to vote. Go and vote for your, your things that you've helped you over the last year. But, of course, I'd very much prefer if you voted for me. And I am going to give another little request as well. It would be awesome if you could also take the time to share this show. So share it on social media, share it with your friends, share it on uh, my WhatsApp groups for, for instructors, local associations, all that sort of stuff. Helps me grow the show, and I really do appreciate it. And if you feel an extra generous, you can always leave me a five-star review as well. You can do that on places like Spotify, on my Facebook page, on Google, or even on Apple Podcasts. And if you want to leave a few kind words, you are more than welcome. And as always, if you hang about to the end of the show, I will read you one of my more recent reviews as well. But for now, I'm going to disappear, and I'm going to let you enjoy the rest of the show. And we're now joined by the ever delightful Emma Hallett. How are we doing, Emma? Oh, good, thank you. Well, thank you for joining us. It's great to have you on. I will just start by saying that you were recommended by a couple of my listeners. You were you were put forward to me as a potential guest, and uh, I was asked to check you out on I believe it's called the XL Podcast. And uh, I thought you came across really well, so I thought I'd get you on. So anyone listening, make sure you go and check out that podcast as well. Um, I'm going to start off by starting off the way that I start most of my shows, because this podcast, we speak to leaders, experts, innovators, and game changers. So which one or ones of those do you think you fall into? Leader, expert, innovator, or game changer? I don't think I'm a game changer, but I, I maybe am a little bit of an innovator and maybe a little bit of an expert. But by no means, there are people that know far more about this topic than I do. But you know an awful lot more than I do. So in comparison to me and probably a lot of the listeners, you will most definitely be an expert. Probably. Yeah, uh, that's my theory on anyway. Um, so do you want to start off by telling us a little bit about you and a little bit about what you do? So uh, I am a uh, well an ADI who qualified uh, in... 2013 so I've been doing it for a fair few years now uh, since 2015 I've specialized in teaching people with additional needs so I started off with people who were autistic dyslexic dyspraxia things like that um, and I did some training with motability in teaching people with adaptations and then just before COVID literally the week we locked it down I bought an adapted car and from then I've been doing quite a lot of work with people with physical disabilities that need to drive with adaptations so that's pretty much what I do now um, my car is adapted I only have an, an adapted automatic car now so I do a, a mix of people who are physically disabled and also have some kind of other additional need I don't have any standard run-of-the-mill learners anymore um, they've all got something going on but I only do that part time now because I work part time as a driving advisor for Cornwall Mobility. And I've been doing that for about nine months. 
Awesome. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there that I want to touch back on specifically, but you mentioned the adapted car, and I think initially that's the thing I'm most curious about because my car is just a uh, standard four-wheel, steering wheel, off-you-go car. So when you talk about an adapted car, what are you actually talking about? Okay, so my car's got fairly basic adaptations. You can get some really complicated very specialist, weird and wonderful stuff that you can do to cars um, that most people have no idea what what these uh, adaptation fitters can do. It's amazing. But my car has the kind of standard adaptations that will help most people, you know, people who don't need anything too specialist. So it's got a, obviously it's an automatic, so it's got a left foot accelerator. So where the clutch pedal would be, an accelerator pedal can flip down and the standard um, right hand accelerator pedal flips up so somebody can drive with their left foot brake and accelerate uh, I've got what's called push pull brake and accelerator so that's a mechanical adaptation it comes like a lever and, and push rods that connect to the pedals and the lever comes out underneath the steering wheel and you push it to brake and you pull it to accelerate and then generally people who are driving like that are going to need some kind of steering aid so I've got a standard steering ball that goes on the car I've also got um, what's called a secondary switching unit, which is a steering aid with buttons on it that allow you to indicate, operate the wipers, the horn, things like that. Um, My car is fairly new, so it's got a lot of stuff on it as standard that make things easier anyway. So it's got an electronic parking brake and cameras and sensors and all of that stuff. Cool. I'm really naive when it comes to this stuff, uh, especially the physical sort of side of it, as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, is there a lot of adaptions there you're talking about that they are removable? So you would take them off and on depending on the student you've got. So my car has two brackets on the steering wheel for the steering aids, and those brackets stay in place. I could take them on and off, but it's fiddly and it's allen keys and generally once they're on you just leave them on unless you have to move them to a slightly different position um the left foot accelerator is flipped up when it's not being used so i i can't remove it i don't need to remove it either the left accelerator pedal is down or the right hand accelerator pedal is down it's one or the other so it it can be driven really easily as standard Uh, the push pull lever is a bit more tricky it can't be moved. It's fixed in place. And it just you just lose a little bit of leg room underneath the steering wheel. So there's nothing that would cause you a problem when you are driving them? No, the only thing is you have to watch your knees when you get in and out of the car. <laughs> the amount of bruises I've had on my, on my knee from getting in and bashing it on the bolt underneath is, yeah, I, I haven't learned that lesson yet. <laughs> The, uh, the sacrifices we make as driving instructors. Um, all right, cool. That was the one that was most curious to me, and, and we might touch back on that in a minute, but I want to rewind a little bit, and I want to ask you what first got you on to working with additional uh, people with additional needs because from my perspective, again, I I do work with some people that um, autism, uh, ADHD, that side of it, but nothing, at least I can recall, or uh, nothing physical. So what was it that, that kind of shifted you in that direction? Okay, so um, when I started my um, ADI journey, I was with BSM. I did my training with them and I did, uh, I stayed with them for two years. And that gave me the opportunity to do um, a course with them, which is done in conjunction with Motability, because BSM hold the contract to do the Motability training. So any Motability customer that needs driving lessons goes through BSM. So... When I started with BSM, I was given some really good advice from one of the trainers that said, whatever skills you've got from previous life, create a little niche for yourself and run with it because that's going to be your you know, selling point. So before I became an instructor, I was working with, um, I was a support worker with kids in care. So a lot of them had some kind of additional need. We'd had to support them in education. We'd had to homeschool some of them because they weren't able to stay in education. There was a lot going on. So I already had some skills and knowledge of how to teach people with various learning disabilities, autism, dyslexia, things like that. So I started off with that, 
the opportunity came to do the motability course. And I thought, actually, that sounds really interesting. So I went up to Surrey for three days and I did that. And I really enjoyed it. And I learned a lot. And I thought, this is really interesting. I'm not someone who I, I, I get really bored if I just do the same thing all the time. So I liked that I learned a lot and was able to um, help people in, in a different way. So I just kind of carried on with that and set myself a long-term plan, well, medium to long-term plan. I was like, in 2020, I'm going to get myself an adapted car, going to give myself five years to get my skills up and, and do what I can in people's own cars before I, I got my own and, and kind of fully committed to that. But obviously, COVID kind of messed plans up a little bit. But I'm, I'm there now. 2022, I'm, I'm fully automatic adaptations, and that's what I do. Awesome. It, it fascinates me that you kind of say you you get bored easily because, again, I, I can see I'm like that a lot. You know, if I do a similar sort of lesson three or four in a row, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to do anymore. Mm -hmm. So is that perhaps why you prefer this, this side of it? I, I would imagine that every lesson is very different. Yeah, I have to think very, it keeps my brain working because I might be teaching somebody who's driving the car as standard and, but has dyspraxia. So there's all sorts of complications with that. And then I might be teaching somebody who's driving with their left foot and a secondary switching unit, or then I might teach somebody who's driving with the pushable hand controls. So I ha my brain has to be quite flexible to think about, you know, silly things like you can't say, put your foot on the brake because they're not putting the foot on the brake they're pushing a lever so it, it things like that that make me think a little bit more about what i'm doing keep it interesting i can, I can imagine that being quite challenging to begin with because like you say that foot on the brake that's just a, a natural mm -hmm. thing you say that you don't think about saying it you just say it. So yeah i can imagine saying that to a student then like you know what brake or what foot yeah, or an yeah. So, what, I was, what uh, foot am i putting on the brake <laughs> Yeah, I've not thought of that one. Um, yeah, interesting. And I think, so that was the other thing I wanted to ask you. So the difference between, I think you referred to them as standard students. I like that phrase. Um, obviously, there's physical differences. But what are the differences in terms of the challenges that, that present themselves to you in, in terms of a lesson? You know, Because I'd imagine that there are some things that are more challenging with a standard, people can't see me, but I'm going to do the, the fingers, yep. um, with a standard student. I'd imagine there's some stuff that's even more, more challenging than, them, than working with someone with additional needs. I think it depends on what you're dealing with. So if you're dealing with somebody who's got a purely physical disability, for example, an amputee, then essentially you're, you can teach them like a standard learner air quotes but you do have to think about how they're driving and understand the challenges of that so uh, I periodically drive my car in safe areas with the adaptation so that I remind myself what it's like to drive with a steering wheel for example or how much more it uses your arm muscles when you're pulling on the accelerator rather than pushing on an accelerator pedal so there's that consideration but then if you've also got somebody who has I used an example of dyspraxia earlier you know there could be all sorts of challenges with dyspraxia that you really need to wrap your head around in order to help them so it's really taking each person on their own individual circumstances I mean something else I do I didn't talk about it earlier but I do training for older drivers who now need to drive with adaptations so you might have somebody who passed their test 60 years ago and now needs to drive with a left foot accelerator because they've had a stroke. So that is a whole other level of complication in and of itself. Because if you imagine you've got somebody who's driven a manual car and they're used to putting that left foot all the way to the floor for a clutch so they don't stall. And now all of a sudden, if they do that, they're going to go maximum acceleration yeah, so you've got to be really on it <laughs> to make sure. But you also, you know, they've been driving for 60 years, so you can't, you're not teaching them to drive. And there's also the challenges of they've been driving for 60 years, so how many bad habits have they got? Do they know what the highway code, do they know, are they up to date on the highway code and all of that sort of stuff? 
So there's, there's, your brain is constantly thinking, how can I help this person achieve their goal? It's very client centered in that way, which is obviously what we're supposed to be doing anyway as instructors. But it's just trying to find that thing that helps that person. And, and it's more than, than what the DVSA talk about in terms of learning, you know, teaching and learning strategies. It is more niche than that because you literally in that moment have to think, what does that person, what does that person need right now? in order to achieve that skill this is is fascinating for me um it's i feel like i've opened a can of worms um (laughs) there's there's a lot of like the stuff you were speaking about there i wouldn't have even considered you know i do a little bit of work with a charity called project edward and Mm -hmm. through that i've discovered more about you know older drivers and, and helping them and that's how it but i'd not considered you know like you get the example of a stroke and it's like yeah that's when you think about it, it's quite obvious, but you don't think about it because it's not happened to me or it's not happened to anyone I know. And and that's fascinating. And I picture my dad now who's like 63 and thinking if he suddenly couldn't use his you know left leg or if he suddenly had to do it this way, it's like how would he handle that? It's, it's, you know, like you say, he's been driving 40 years or whatever. It's quite, that must be really daunting. So it, have you got a, a preference um, keeping the theme on you for a second, have you got a preference of the type of person you work with, if that makes sense? Not really. I'm quite happy to to help anybody and, and with everything. I, I Again, I would get bored if I did the same, <laughs> <laughs> same thing. I like the fact that, you know, I've got – at the moment I've got – I only do um, nine or ten – people I only see nine or ten pupils in a week now because I'm part-time and I currently have three that have cerebral palsy and I'm thinking god this is going to be quite um getting quite dull I've got three with the same condition you know I like the variety I like the interest because it's it's it keeps me thinking it keeps me on my toes and I think that makes me a better instructor for for that yeah cool Uh, I, I want to switch this slightly now I want to look at it from um sort of an instructor standpoint that hasn't done this before Mm -hmm. so you obviously hadn't didn't start off by by doing this you've you've changed this so we'll use me as example i've had a couple of students with autism and a couple of students with adhd that type of stuff you know so do you think there's a line that they would that i would need to cross or get to at some point where i would have to go actually, I can't work with these people anymore. I'm going to have to send it to, to yourself, for example, someone more specialist. Hmm. I think it just depends on how much you feel able to do. You know, there are people who locally who will come to me because they know what I do and they know that I have experience and all the rest of it. And they'll say, I'm really struggling with this person with this. Do you have any advice? Can you help me? And I've taken pupils out on behalf of other instructors before like as for, for a one-off you know for a, an hour or two just to see fresh eyes on the situation and go actually have you tried this have you tried that so I think that's the kind of the first point of of getting getting advice from somebody else and if you really feel like you can't cope then the time is to say actually you need somebody more specialist yeah. I mean, I'd, you know, with the physical side of stuff, I'd imagine that's fairly obvious in, in the sense of my car's got no ad, uh, adaptations, mm-hmm. so therefore there's certain things I can't do. Um, but I suppose more with the mental side, it's like, and I think this is maybe where you mentioned it before, clan set of learning, you know, I, I my take on it is you've had this condition for 20 years, for example. You've already got some coping strategies around that, so I'm going to ask you, Mm-hmm. how you can best deal with this situation. I think I mentioned this on a recent podcast, actually, but I've got a, a student with ADHD, and she's told me that the car that I drive is quite bland, and because it's bland, she's getting bored in the lesson because there's nothing to occupy your mind. And she's asked if she can prettify it on the next lesson, um, which is making me slightly apprehensive, but I'm kind of looking <laughs> forward to it. Um, and But again, that's me saying what what will work for you. So yeah. that client set of learning approach, is that just a really good place to start in those situations? I think so. I mean, that's great that you're letting her her 
do that. That's fantastic. That's exactly what you need to do. How you know, ask them how they manage because they've been through education. So they they've got some strategies already, even if they don't really know that it's a strategy. I mean, I had one lad um, in my old car, the steering ball, you know, the brackets on the steering ball had little buttons on them in order to release the ball. So you'd push the button in, put the ball in, then release the button. So obviously he was driving the car without the steering ball. So he just used to click the buttons if he was getting a bit stressed. (laughs) And just having that little, almost like a fidget spinner Mm. situation. Because that was, he couldn't have a fidget spinner in the car, obviously but it was something he could do to keep his hand occupied while he was driving that didn't actually cause any problems. Because if you're driving in a straight line, what harm is it going to be to to press a button that doesn't do anything? Yeah. And I think it's just trying to find those kind of ways of doing it that suit that person. But it also is also being, I mean, you said about um, you know, something you touched on just now, it just reminded me of a pupil I've got at the moment who, uh, who's got cerebral palsy. And he's come to me because he was driving a standard automatic with his left foot. So he was reaching his left foot across to the, to the right-hand accelerator pedal. Mm. And he, he got almost to test like that. And then he moved. So it was, um, you know, obviously the situation changed. He ended up with me and and we're now doing a left foot accelerator but he said to me the other day I haven't got any pain after my driving lesson I always used to have pain because he was reaching across so far he was getting pain in his left leg and it's things like instructors need to be aware that that isn't that adaptations are out there and people shouldn't be driving a standard accelerator a standard automatic with their left foot because it can cause all sorts of long-term problems yeah, I think it's, and I'm, you know, when you think about it, it's the same with anything, isn't it? You know, if I had a silly example, but someone in the, the car the other day that was trying to find their biting point and couldn't find it. And the reason they couldn't find it is because the engine wasn't switched on. But she's gonna she's getting ready to release the handbrake and set off. I'm like, have you found your biting point? She says, no. I says, so why releasing the handbrake? She's like, well, I can't find it. I'm like, but why? And then she's thought about it and worked out why. And it, to me, it's that principle that if something don't feel right, probably shouldn't be doing it so if if something's wrong for that student we should be looking for a way to help them and i think sometimes we have to admit so again i'll use me as an example because i'm you know not a specialist I, I would have to admit actually i can't help you now for whatever reason um i'm going to help you find someone who can or you know and i think that do you think that there's a potentially I don't, you may have seen this is there a reluctance from adis there potentially like the example you just gave of the the previous adi making that kid use his left foot for the the right accelerator i don't know i think maybe there's a um and a certain amount of ignorance about what's actually out there and how much you can help people because locally because i shout quite a lot about what I do um, I talk quite a lot about if, if, if I'm at the test center I'm talking about what I do and people are asking me questions about my car all the time and that is spreading that knowledge and and someone might have a chat someone I don't know might have a chat with somebody I do know at the test center and go I'm really struggling with it and they'll go ah talk to Emma she knows what she's doing she's got an adapted car maybe she can help and all of this stuff um and I think it is just having that network and having that knowledge and, and spreading that knowledge, um, which is great that, you know, we're able to have this chat tonight. And I hopefully some more people will find out a bit more about adaptations and the options that are out there. But, you know, there's a lot of information if you go looking for it. You know, there's disabilitydrivinginstructors.com and they have a, a Facebook group. Um, that you can ask questions and everyone's really helpful and there's far more knowledgeable knowledgeable people than me on there um, but it's it's just finding the right person in the first place and asking the right questions yeah I mean just turning that back to to instructors then you mentioned the website there disability drivers instructors.com where would you is that where you would suggest instructors started you know whether it's because they've, they've got a student with uh, additional needs or whether it's because they're just looking to do something different where would you recommend the start learning to develop i mean there's a lot of information available there but also just so 
as I mentioned in the introduction, I work for Cornwall Mobility part time, which is a driving assessment centre. Um, and that's part of a network of driving assessment centres all over the country. So making contact with the local driving assessment centre, and I say local in a very loose term because there's only one in Scotland, for example. Um, so local might not be super local, but it's just trying to find out a, how, you know, you get more information from them. They're, as driving advisors, we are there to support driving instructors as well as clients. So instructors can ask questions and we can find out for them if we don't know the answers. And there's a lot of knowledge there that needs to kind of, you know, we're not trying to hoard that knowledge. We want to get it out and we want people to know, you know, and find solutions because life's so much better for the, the people when they've got the right setup in the car. And we're just taking a slight pause in the show to give a big shout out to the latest sign-ups to the Instructor Podcast Premium. And they are Kevin Douglas and Carol Hershenson. Now, if I've uh, pronounced that name wrong, Carol, I do apologise. But big thank you to you guys for signing up to Instructor Podcast Premium. And a big thank you to everyone else that has also signed up. It's great to have you on board, and these guys are already getting access to over 70 exclusive premium shows, including things around the standards check and coaching, and exclusive shows by San Harper, Bob Morton, and, and Robin Bates of Coaching for Geeks. But on top of that, there's other content that goes over there as well. So I've started doing a new weekly post. It's a written post, one of my favorite things, called Friday Feeling which is essentially where I'm just sharing a bit of wisdom and, and sharing some updates on the show. And we're also kicking off a five-day challenge to get people ready for the new year. So five-day challenge in December, ready for the new year. And of course, as a premium member, you also get a load of discounts for a variety of places, including the Guild of Mindful Drivers, it's clients that are learning and the ADI and PDI doctor. And you get all that for only £10 a month. So if you would like to sign up for £10 a month and get access to all that awesome stuff, then you can head over to the instructorpodcast.com. Go check out the premium section over there. Or if you go to the show notes of this podcast, you'll find a direct link to take you there. So take a moment to go and check out the Instructor Podcast Premium. But for now, let's dive back into the show. Yeah. I mean, sticking with the sort of the, the, the mental side of it for a second, uh, I think the three we've mentioned so far, so I've mentioned autism, ADHD, and you've mentioned um, dyspraxia. Um, from my guess would be that autism and ADHD are more common, uh, especially mm -hmm. nowadays compared to a while ago, but something like dyspraxia, to the best of my recollection, I've never taught anyone with it. Um, so, what are some of the maybe less common conditions that, that we might come across? Oh, um, dyscalculia is one that lot, not a lot of people have heard of. So that's like dyslexia with numbers. Right. So um, that can cause issues with something as simple as a speedometer. But it also has a lot more, a lot of the associated uh, dyslexia issues like left-right confusion and things like that. <laughs> Oh, trying to think now because to me they're all quite quite obvious yeah. so things like uh arlene's syndrome that's one that is often resolved with colored lenses so people will have colored so if you ever have somebody come to a lesson with colored glasses they probably got arlene syndrome right and and then it's things like the the physical conditions that affect that have a cognitive impact that people may not realize. So things like cerebral palsy and multiple sclerosis that are fairly common in younger people um, that can have all sorts of um, issues with processing and fatigue, anything that's going to affect your cognition, really. It's interesting, you know, uh, you mentioned multiple sclerosis there because um, my ex-wife has multiple sclerosis and it was fascinating the way it affected her driving because it actually improved it. <laughs> it's very weird in that because she was able to sit in a, a, a situation where she was more comfortable. There was less stress in her body. It was, it was mm -hmm. like it was perfect for her and she was just able to zone it. I mean, she's a bad driver. But she was able to to 
to drive more competently, if that makes sense. So yeah. in, in a weird way, that um, that condition actually had a, a positive effect on her. You know, I suppose, yeah. have, you, is, have you come across that before in any other conditions where that's improved? I mean, I know, for example, something like ADHD, um, or at least I've been told, that if you can get them focusing correctly, it actually helps them with their concentration a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just depends on the person and how what their coping strategies are. I would. I. It's funny you should mention ADHD because that was the one I was thinking of. Um, but also s- some conditions that cause that can cause pain, depending on on how that is. <laughs> you you might find you know if you've got for example somebody who's got something like Ehlers Danlos syndrome um, that affects and maybe they're driving with hand controls because their lower limbs aren't so good then actually they're 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 seated they're quite comfortable and because they're driving with their upper limbs they're not really feeling any impact from that yeah all right so taking it back and dumbing it down for me um the let's imagine for a second someone gets in the car and due to the way they're behaving i'm starting to think maybe there's an issue there somewhere but they haven't disclosed anything. How would I approach that situation, do you think? Have you asked them before they've got in the car? No, but let me, well, I felt let me ask you that question. How would you ask that question? I have an application form. Right. So my application form has uh, a question on there about, um, do you have any medical conditions or additional needs that may impact on your driving? or something to that effect. And then I sort of give examples that say things like, e.g., dyslexia, uh, mental health, cerebral palsy, um, things like that. And then hopefully they will answer that honestly. And then the next question is, if you do, how does that impact you? That's so uh, you, you know when someone says something and it just clicks, I go, yes, that's really obvious. So I had one of those moments. I I, I use um, uh, GoRoadie as my diary app, and they've got uh, an inquiry manager system where students just inquire through that, and that question's not on there. So I now know what I'm going to be emailing as soon as I finish this, this podcast. Um, I think that's that's great. And, but all right, let me let me ask that a different way then. So I haven't asked that question. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of instructors don't ask that question, yeah. including me. And then someone gets in the car and I'm then thinking, oh, something's not right here. Um, so then you're f- actually verbally face-to-face, I suppose, going to have to speak about that, I suppose. So how would, you, how would you raise that, do you think, in the most tactful way? Because I'm not always the most tactful. I think it depends on the rapport that you've built up with that pupil. If you've got a good enough relationship that you can say, look, you know, is there anything going on here? Did you ever struggle at school? Did you have any any extra help with your exams or anything like that? Um, Finding out what school they went to can sometimes help. Um, If you know what the local school name is for the school for the kids with the additional needs, then if they've gone to that school, you know they've got something going on because otherwise they would have been in mainstream education. So then that's a sort of half clue that there's something going on there. But it's just trying to be as tactful as you can. But if that person is very um, finds it very difficult to talk about their condition, then it might be a conversation with the parents if mm. there's a parent involved. Um, I had one girl who was autistic but wouldn't acknowledge that she was autistic. So her mum told me, but she it was not something that I could ever, ever, ever have a conversation with her about directly because she refused to acknowledge it. Okay, cool. So, you know, sometimes you you could ask them straight out and they might still refuse. I think what's interesting here as well is the, the way I'm asking these questions because I just caught myself doing it, asking them as if it, it's, it's an awkward situation or if it's uh, like the – they're not normal. That's kind of, you know, it's that, that, that logic. And I'm just thinking back to a situation I had recently. And it escapes me exactly what it was, but one of my students, I didn't know this. It wasn't a colostomy bag, but it was something similar. And, and there was an issue with it, and she, I didn't know about it. 
and it wasn't it never caused a problem in any of the lessons but on this last year I need to get out I'm like I didn't even ask why because you know when you can tell there's something wrong with the shoe I'm like okay let's pull up we just need to get around corn and and she started telling me what it was. I'm like, right, I'll jump. I jumped out. I've got my coat. She's around the corner. I'm kind of holding my coat up to cover her in. And it's like, there's no thought there over, oh, this is weird. Watch it. It's just like, you just treat them as, it's just normal. And I think yeah. that even with the questions I'm asking, I'm asking them in that that different way. Is that is that something you come across a lot? I think it's just, just being upfront and, and, and open with people, isn't it? Yeah. You know, if you know... I mean, even silly things like if you you need to know if the person in your car is severely asthmatic because you might decide one day to put a different perfume on or use some air freshener. And then that's going to trigger an asthma attack as soon as that pupil gets in the car. So it's things like that. You, You need to know this stuff. But I mean, even a little subtle thing you can do when you get someone to read a number plate on their first driving lesson just before they do it, just say, oh, if you, you know, dyslexic or anything like that before they do it. And then, and then they go, oh, no, no, no. And it's like, oh, I just wanted to check if you've, because, you know, if you had, I've, I, we can do it in a different way or something like that, you know. And, uh, but they might turn around and go, oh, yeah, actually, I am dyslexic. And then you know straight off that there's, there's something going on. So it's, it's kind of going in the back door a little bit with some things. Yeah. I mean, there's some tips and tricks at trade coming out here. Um, I definitely need to change my, uh, I mean, you've got an application form at my entry form. Uh, and I think that's a little genius tip. That's a perfect time to ask, you know. Um, it's a bit like, you know, my left and rights when we're talking about the mirrors. I'll always ask then. I'll say, oh, do you have a problem with left and right at all? Because, you know, and because you're talking about left and right anyway, it doesn't seem out of the blue. Yeah. And. I do sometimes find that left and right question leads on to other stuff. You know, that's the case where I get the student that says, oh, yeah, uh, I struggle with my left and right and this and this. It's like we mentioned the kind of worms before. I think, you know, if you ask them that one question, they'll sometimes, you know, tell you a lot more and you can get garner a lot of information there. So, yeah, good good stuff there. I like that. Okay, moving back onto the, the physical sort of side of it and then the physical disabilities, have you, and I think this is more of a personal curiosity question, but have you ever come across a student where you, I'm going to say give up on, maybe that's the wrong term, but where you've just not been able to get enough or the right adaptions to actually make it work for them? Um, I've only ever had, so if, if I talk about driving instruction, not being a driving advisor and the stuff I do for court mobility, because that's a whole different issue. So in terms of being a driving instructor, there's only been two occasions where I've had to say to somebody that they're not going to be able to to succeed. So one was a a gentleman with dyspraxia who'd been trying to drive for five years with a couple of other driving instructors and he just just couldn't get beyond that certain level. You know, he'd reached that plateau and... And no matter what I tried to do, we just couldn't couldn't get him past that point. So we agreed between us that actually there wasn't going to be a solution for him. Um, and then there was an 88-year-old gentleman who'd had an amputation who just couldn't adapt. He, he just couldn't get his head around the adaptations. We tried a couple of different options, but we couldn't find a solution for him. Okay. Interesting. Um, right. So uh, I, I, before I move on, because I do want to ask you about your, you mentioned it a couple of times, your Cornwall uh, mobility and what you do with your role is there. Mm-hmm. Um, but just before we move on, the, kind of the final question around that, the instructor. So let's imagine there's an instructor listening to this and they are inspired by you, as I'm sure they all are, but inspired enough to go and become uh, specializing in um, working with people with additional needs. Does it require a certain type of person, do you think? Do you think you need a certain type of mindset to make that shift? And um, I suppose the second part of the question will be, what advice would you give to that person? Um, I think you need to be somebody who, first of all, is willing to um, constantly learn because there is no way that you could you could do this job and stay still. You have to learn. You have to understand 
every time you get somebody different, you have to understand how that condition affects them and how you can help them. And, you know, sometimes you come across some conditions that you've never heard of before. And then there's a whole rabbit warren of, of research to do. Um, but I think there's also, you, you've got to be prepared to do this uh, with patience. These people are going to take a lot longer to pass. And there's going to be a lot of, well, not, not everybody's going to take longer to pass. Sometimes with physical disabilities, there's no cognition, no cognitive issues at all. They can pass in 40 hours or whatever. But sometimes you might have somebody for 200, 300 hours so, and you might feel like you're banging your head against brick wall sometimes. But as long as they're making progress, even if it's baby steps, that's fine. And it's just about staying positive through all of that. Um, but we'll say, you know, adapted cars aren't cheap. <laughs> so you've got to be in it for the financial commitment as well. And, and be prepared to keep that car for long enough to warrant the investment in those adaptations. Yeah. Um, so the second part of your question was what advice I would give. Yeah, yeah, 21 thinking about dedicating to the profession like you have. I would think I would certainly make contact with your local assessment centre or local disability driving instructor and maybe sit in on some lessons if you can. Um have a little play around you know I took a, a driving instructor out recently in, in my car around the local industrial estate at the weekend and showed him the different you know getting to drive with the different adaptations and you know it's just understanding a bit more about it um, but certainly do some training courses do as many training courses as you can find because they are invaluable and the, the more trainers you do those training courses with the more knowledge you're going to pick up would you advise that to potentially every instructor to, to do those courses, to, to broaden your skills and broaden your knowledge anyway? I mean, it's not going to, it's not going to hurt. It would be, it would be good. It would be great, but it's probably unrealistic for everybody to do them. I think it, it just depends. Everybody specializes, don't they? You get to a point where you start, you know, you, you think, oh, I'm going to do fleet work or I'm going to become an audit trainer or um, I'm going to start my own driving school or like I've done, I'm gonna I'm gonna work with people with disabilities. So, you know, it's just a, no. We can't have everybody as a specialist. It's unrealistic. But if everybody had a little bit of knowledge, you know, there's there's a um, a level two course that I did a few years ago. Um, it was free. I think it took about twenty or thirty hours to do, and that was in um, different learning difficulties. So. Um, dyspraxia, dyslexia, autism, things like that. And it was really useful, you know, and things like that. It's, it's free CPD and you'll learn a lot. Yeah. Um, would you consider, because I know you said you, you work sort of exclusively with people with additional needs, would you consider taking on some, you know, if someone came to you specifically and said, um, you know, I want to work, it's a standard student, if you like, came to you and spoke, said, so, uh, I've heard you on Terry's podcast. You sounded awesome. I want to come and work with you. Would you turn them down? I wouldn't turn them down, no. But I I have to prioritise people who need my specialist skills. Yeah. And adapt adapted cars are very few and far between. So my area, the area that I cover is, is massive. Um, and because of that, there's more travelling and things like that. So I can't see as many people as I'd like to do um, and sometimes it is a case of finding somebody else for them who I know has got some experience or um, has done some training or and I can support them you know in finding somebody who I know is a good driving instructor but doesn't ne isn't necessarily a, doesn't necessarily have the specialist skills that I do yeah, I suppose it's a bit like using a, a disability spot at the ASDA. You know, you um, it's there. You could theoretically go in it, but if if you don't need it, you should be going somewhere else. Um, yeah. Okay, so Cornwall Mobility, uh, I'm mm -hmm. interested by this. Tell me a, a bit more about what your role is and what, what that entails there. So I'm employed as a driving advisor. So I work three days a week, part-time. Um and I work as part of a team. We have driving ADIs and occupational therapists in the team. And we usually work together. 
so one ADI and one OT. So predominantly what we do is fitness to drive assessments. So we have usually older drivers, full, full license holders, let's say, but the vast majority of them are over the age of 60. Um, and they could be referred to us by the DVLA or the police or a GP or consultant. So, or they can refer themselves. So they could be that they've been recently diagnosed with a condition like a stroke uh, and we need to check their fit to drive before they go back on the road. It could be they have a condition like dementia and we need to see them every year to make sure they're still fit to drive. Uh, it could be that the police have referred them to us because they've had an incident. Maybe they had a collision and they can come to us for a fitness to drive assessment as an alternative to attending court. So there's a vast array of conditions and reasons why people might come and see us. We do also do driving assessments for adaptations. So you might have somebody younger who's maybe got MS and now can no longer, no longer has use of their legs and we need to assess them, make sure they can drive with hand controls. We do have provisional license holders occasionally and pre-provisional, so people maybe who have an acquired brain injury as a child and then we need to assess to see if they've got potential to learn to drive before they actually apply for their uh, provisional license. Uh, do you say you did that three days a week? Yes. Is And this is probably my naivety again, so apologies, but is there enough work to keep you there busy for those three days a week? Uh, yes. <laughs> so we do... <laughs> we Sorry, do, people um, can't see your reaction there. No, we, we do uh, some driving lessons in around that as well. So if we've got somebody who needs, who's had a stroke, they now need to drive with their left foot and their left side steering aid, then we might do some few lessons for them to get them up to standard um before we set them out on on the road um but yeah there there is so it's myself and a colleague um adi based in in exeter and in theory we should do eight assessments a week in exeter um and we have a i don't know three four month waiting list and have had the whole time i've been there pretty much um, there, there is quite a lot of demand. I mean, our our area is quite big, to be fair, because we cover we have, so Cornwall Mobility is really that's the name of the company, but really we're Devon and Cornwall, so we cover all of Devon and all of Cornwall over three centres. So, you know, our Exeter centre gets people from Somerset and uh, half of Devon, so it's a pretty big area, and there's a lot of people in that area that have all sorts of medical conditions and we do get quite as I say quite a few referrals from the police as well so the question I want to ask is is what's next because you've spoke quite a lot on this podcast uh, about you know get bored easy the variety mm -hmm. of stuff that you do you've got these two different roles uh sort of different and challenging have you got anything else lined up what's next for Emma <laughs> well Next year, um, I will hopefully be doing a diploma through uh, Oxford Brookes University, which is part of my Cornwall Mobility role. So that should keep me busy for the next couple of years. And then, I don't know. <laughs> see where I am. I mean, just, I did... Just a I diploma. Did see, <laughs> I did see a really, um, what we call uh, high-tech adaptation. So the more specialist stuff I kind of mentioned earlier. I did see a vehicle earlier, um, a few months ago, that was adapted with all of that sort of stuff, and I thought about it, and I thought, do I do I want to buy that Mercedes Sprinter that's got all this all this stuff on it? And I thought, no, no, <laughs> but maybe maybe in the future I might be a bit. One of my cars paid off, I might be a bit more tempted to um to look at doing some of that. But I don't know that there's enough demand really to warrant that. That was more of a. a maybe no probably shouldn't sort of moment <laughs> uh, but I think uh, the what I'm doing now gives me quite a lot of variety especially um you know doing the driving assessments because you meet all sorts of people and and I learn so much from working with the occupational therapist as well so I'm always learning I'm always researching stuff and and at the moment I can't see myself getting bored for quite a while doing that so hopefully 
that will keep me going for a while. Um, I'm a big believer in doing what you love. I'm a big believer in job satisfaction and, and you know, feeling that reward from what you do. Uh, I get the impression that you have a lot of job satisfaction and that, and that you do feel that. Do you feel like you've, you enjoy what you do more now and you get more reward from what you do now than just from doing the, the standard lessons previously? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it, it, don't get me wrong. The, especially the, the, driving assessments I do for Cornwall Mobility, you know, when you have to tell somebody that they're not safe to drive anymore. And, you know, you can have, we do two assessments in a day. You could have a really, you could have two really difficult assessments in a day. And it, it's it's a challenge. It takes it out of you. But then you have other days where you, you have, uh, you can find a solution to somebody's problem. Um, and that is a great feeling. And then you do the training with them and actually see them, master that adaptation and and know that they're going to get their life back and their independence back and I think there is a lot more um for me I think there's a lot more reward from getting a 17 year old wheelchair user through their driving test knowing that that is going to then you know completely change their life to somebody who just needs to learn to drive because they're 17 and they can. It's uh, it's interesting. I just had a flashback to, well, in fact, I was talking about it with her recently, actually. Um, we'd, we'd done a lesson and she, we finished her lesson and she started crying. And I asked why she were crying and she said, because it's the first lesson she hadn't cried during the lesson and she was just oh. really happy. I'm like, well, yeah, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That, but we were talking about it because I'm saying how impressed and how proud I am of her, of where she's come from. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas, as you said, your standard 17-year-old lad comes in and you don't have those uh, conversations, you don't have those problems. It's just A to B, often without a lot of issue. And, and I'm not mocking that, you know, at all. You know, it's probably better for those people. But you're right, helping people overcome those challenges is is really rewarding. Um. Okay, is there anything else you would like to cover around around those topics? Anything else you'd think that you'd maybe benefit from shouting out to the listeners? Not really. It's just if if anybody is curious, just find somebody who knows what they're talking about and ask them a load of questions. Because disability driving instructors tend to be in it because they're passionate about what they're doing and they want to help people. So they want to tell you what they do because they want you to help people as well. <laughs> so, you know, I, I could talk, well, we have talked for a while, but I could talk for hours. You know, I can really bore some driving instructors talking about all this sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, the the stuff that's available, the adaptations, what, what people can do to a vehicle to get somebody mobile is absolutely phenomenal and you know, it really is life changing. If you've got somebody who's lost the use of their legs, they they can't walk very far at all anymore. They're completely dependent on a vehicle to get around to live their life, like most of us take for granted. Then it really is life changing. I am going to take this opportunity to offer you and anyone else that may come on this podcast a piece of advice, and that is never ever tell me you can talk for hours. <laughs> because there's a strong chance that I will take you up on it. But, um, you know, maybe we'll get you back on to speak a bit more about, about the adaptations. Maybe there's something we can do there to, to showcase those a bit more. But I am going to finish up by asking you the song that I like to ask everyone that we finish, and it's about the Instructor Podcast Spotify playlist. So what is your ultimate driving song, Emma? Well, I had a bit of a think about this, and I've decided to say Train, well, Drops of Jupiter by Train. I am going to have to look that one up. That is the first song that I have come across uh, that I do not know. Well, so, it's a good uh, one because it's not too it's not too fast paced because you don't want a driving song that's really too much upbeat because then you'll be racing off and speeding everywhere. So I'm okay. being a bit of a sensible driving instructor there and giving that answer. 
Good shout, but uh, I'll be looking forward to checking that out. Um, yes, uh, what was that? Train? Oh, I'll listen to it. Drops of worry. Jupiter by Train. Drops of Jupiter by Train. Uh, wow. Yeah, and if you want to listen to the the, the Instructor Podcast players, head over to Spotify, search for the Instructor, or you can find it in the show notes, which is also where you can find all of Emma's details. So do you want to tell people where they can find you or maybe how you can potentially help them? So my website is drivewithemma.co.uk. Um, and if you want to find out more about the assessment centres, then if you search for driving mobility, then you can find your local assessment centre on there. Awesome. Um, yeah, I just want to take a moment to thank you for today. I think it's been awesome. Um, I've said that a couple of times in the same sentence, so that's good. Um, but the other thing, uh, just to finish up on as well, one thing you said at the end, I've noticed myself, and I said it during the show, pussyfooting around a little bit. You know, around some of these questions, I think that maybe we just need to not be afraid to ask sometimes. But um, but yes, a big thank you for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. So a big thank you to Emma Hallett for joining me there. Uh, another cracking episode, I feel. And it was interesting. I mentioned it during the episode, how I found myself kind of being a bit cautious with some of the questions I was asking, you know, um, I use the phrase pussy footing around a little bit. And and I think I was, and it, it made me reflect a little bit afterwards. I wonder if I'm a little bit too much like that with uh, with my students at the time, you know, don't necessarily want to be direct and in their face, but I think maybe we can be a bit too gently, gently. So, uh, yeah, it was an interesting one for me. And uh, I'm sure that uh, you've gained some tips and insights from that. But as I mentioned, it is uh, the end of the show, and I'm going to give you one of my uh, more recent and more favorable reviews. And this one is from Passing with Nick Smith, and it is on Apple Podcasts. And Nick says, Terry's The Instructor Podcast is a great resource for the driver training profession. Not every episode will be to everyone's taste, but there are nuggets to take away from every one of them. The option of a bit more Terry from the premium channel is well worth the monthly charge, but the free content should be required listening for all instructors. There you go, required listening for all instructors. I wonder if we can uh, we can have a word of the DVSA and make it mandatory that everyone has to listen to this podcast. That would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? But you heard him talk about the premium content there. If you're not signed up, if you haven't checked it out, go check it out, www.theinstructorpodcast.com. You'll find some information around the premium stuff over there. Go sign up for 10 quid. Sign up for 10 quid for one month. You'll get access to over 70 exclusive posts, shows, videos, all that kind of stuff. Loads of awesome stuff over there. And if you don't like it, you can always leave. And if you really don't like it, you join up for one day and you, you're you not impressed at all, let me know. And I will happily refund you back that, that money. That's not an issue at all. But I think so far, everyone that's joined up has been, uh, been pretty happy. So go and check it out. Treat yourself. And the last thing I'll say on this... Uh, my goal for the year was to get one person signed up every month, and I haven't had anyone sign up in December yet. So do not let me down. If you wish to make my Christmas, go and sign up for the Instructor Podcast and see how you like it. But I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to love you and leave you, and I'm going to let you enjoy the rest of your week. And if you listen on Sunday, have a very merry Sunday. And whatever other day you're listening, have a very merry other day. The Instructor Podcast with Terry Cook. Talking with leaders, innovators, experts and game changers about what drives them.